Hi, good morning, good afternoon, or good wherever you are when you're watching this on YouTube. Uh, my name is Evan Statton, I'm joined today with, by Thomas Edwards, and we are solutions architects at AWS in the media and entertainment group. And today we're going to talk to you about uncompressed video in the cloud. Uh, how, why, and you know, maybe even why not? And then we'll take questions at the end. But um, there have been many questions coming to us over the past few months about customers who want to do this. So we thought we would give a technical presentation about how exactly it works, because a lot of times we get into um, you know, what specifically customers are doing with it. And this seemed like the right forum for a technical deep dive. So we'll go as deep as we can in 25 minutes and then feel free to you know, contact Thomas or I anytime you'd like and, and we can spend time with you uh, or come back another time if there's, if there's questions. So you know us both, we're, we're here to help. So Thomas, go ahead. Okay, go. well, let's go one? over. Yeah, go. Yep, yep, great. So today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, a review of SMPTE 2110 and what on-prem networks look like. We'll talk about ECMP, the Equal Cost Multipath Routing. We're going to discuss what a cloud network looks like and what happens when you try to have large flows of UDP in the cloud. We'll talk about SRD, the Scalable Reliable Datagram, a way of effectively transmitting large flows over cloud networks. And we'll talk about CDI, the cloud digital interface, how we transport audio, video, and other metadata, such as closed captions and uh, SCSI 35 triggers over uh, the SRD. And then we'll have so hopefully a little bit of time for questions. So many of you already have a 2110 network on your premises. And in, you know, in some situations, it looks like this, a spine leaf network with top of rack switches feeding the spine network. Uh, in other situations, it might just be one big uh, switch that's maybe got a chassis and a whole bunch of line cards if your installation is not so big. But regardless, in all these situations, you generally have your flows being you know, what they call in the network terms, elephant flows. There's a single path flow and for HD, it's about a gigabit per second for SMPTE 2110 20. It's routed through the network using a couple of different techniques. One might be software defined networking, SDN. One might be uh, ECMP, the equal cost multipath routing. Uh, some folks use uh, a P a PIM, uh, which is the protocol independent multicast routing. And there might be a couple of others. But at the end of the day, your on premise network is engineered for the guaranteed bandwidth for these huge flows which are moving through the network. It's a single path flow, which is nice because it avoids packet reordering. There is no need for a large amount of RAM on the receiver to be able to reorder uh, the packets if they, if they came in wrong, right? You just don't need that because they come in in the same order that you send them. So let's talk a bit about ECMP. Uh, ECMP is equal cost multipath routing. And what that basically means is the flows leave a switch based on a hash of a certain number of packet headers. And generally it's called the five tuple because it's these five key packet headers, source IP, destination IP, the protocol, whether it's UDP or TCP, the source port and the destination port. So there are some other types of ECMP that use slightly different packet headers, but this, is, this tends to be the, the typical one. So if you have a flow coming in, and let's say the source is 192.168.1.2, destination 239.005, it's UDP, source 2000, destination 2000, and it, that, that hashes to go out the left side of this top of rack switch. If you have another flow, even if it's coming in on the same port, but it's got a slightly different destination IP address, that may hash to going out the right side of the port. So basically the ports that it exits the switch from depends on the hash of the five tuple. So let's go back to our typical 2110 on-prem network where our flow is moving along just fine. It's UDP. It has uh, the nice advantage of it's only going through three switch hops. It's probably 
somewhere between a handful and maybe 20 or 30 microseconds latency, right? Almost zero latency. It's a wonderful world. It's all of a sudden a giant foot falls out of the sky and crushes one of your switches. Now, hopefully you're using SMPTE 2022 7 redundancy. You've got an A network and a B network or a red network and a blue network. And because uh, the switch goes out, you have a whole nother network uh, to keep your flows going and your broadcasts stay on air. And if you have a smart routing system, eventually there'll be a routing update that'll try to solve this problem by moving all of the traffic over to that other spine switch. But during that time, a gigabit per second of data is being just tossed into the bit bucket. Uh, UDP transmission of SMPTE 2110 has no retransmission capabilities. Once those packets are lost, they're lost forever. And there's nothing you can do about that. But of course, again, we, we've got 2022-7 in our on-premise network, so hopefully this shouldn't be a problem. And also, it's not like you're randomly rebooting switches in your network. Uh, generally, you're going to wait for a maintenance window. It might be three in the morning and you're off air, and then you can uh, successfully uh, update a switch's software or something along those lines. Now let's go to the cloud network. You want to take it from here, Evan? Sure, I'll take a swag at it. Um, so here we look at a cloud network, which is typically a high radix, sorry, high radix folded class topology, also with ECMP. Um, basically, if you're looking at this diagram, you say, well, that looks similar. And in some ways it is, it's just way bigger is, is the main difference here. There are many more tiers. These are how many rectangles we happen to be able to fit onto a slide without them getting, uh, you know, just blurry. But if you were to actually take a look at, at how many network devices were in a cloud network, uh, it would be, you know, many, many times bigger than, than something like this. Uh, it would be wider and it would be uh, taller as well. So there's more layers and those layers are much wider. And so what that means essentially is that as flows hash through the network, um, you know, just like Thomas was talking about, they can take any path through the network, except the difference is instead of there being, you know, maybe two to four, depending on how you configured your network, uh, there's thousands of possible paths through the network. So, you know, we looked at this and we said, how do we, how do we make this work right for video where it's wider, it's bigger, there's more bandwidth, but, um, you know, there's more opportunities for switches to go down for maintenance or just, you know, many times more optics in the system, you know, eventually stuff uh, gets dirty, goes bad, needs to be replaced, needs to be upgraded. Um, and so the last point at the bottom that we made is TCP may write it out, but not UDP. Um, it's an interesting thing. TCP will write it out, but you'll get a variable latency profile because of it. So what'll happen is if you lose a switch or, you know, or an optic somewhere, for example, um, you know, your TCP window will change, you'll get a retransmit, it'll probably work, but maybe your video is late at that point. And when you're talking about uncompressed, it's pretty big. So, you know, TCP, uh, I, I don't know. I personally haven't tested uncompressed TCP. So anyway, the point is UDP that we're familiar with here would, would drop like Thomas was talking about. So, ah, here's a picture of it. Okay, so here's the backstory here, right? We did a test because customers said, hey, we want to try uncompressed in the cloud. Let's, you know, send some UVP 2110 elephant flows through and see what happens. And th this is what happens. So for the most part, the packets get around. But, you know, every once in a while, like we were talking about, something happens in the network. You know, maybe there was a little congestion. Maybe there was a device failure somewhere. Um, and then you get these momentary dips in the, the packet rate, which is bad for video. Like, I don't, I don't think there's any video customers that would accept this um, and think that this was good. So we needed to figure out to do a, a better way. Right, so the solution was a new protocol essentially. So how do we take advantage of the width of the network and the uh, ECMP nature of it and you know, just make video reliable? And so if you look at the bottom, there's actually a article that was written by uh, some of the folks that we work with that goes into deep, deep depth about this 
scalable, reliable datagram that CDI is built on top of. And it's, a, it's an IEEE uh, publication, the link's at the bottom. And, um, you know, please go there. I found the article interesting, so maybe you will too. But basically, the idea here is that you take your payload, in this case, frames of video, and you spray it across multiple paths in the network that we call flowlets. And we do that by essentially manipulating the five tuples that Thomas was talking about. So, you know, you might think that um, if you have a hundred different paths through a network, you might, um, you know, create 100 flowlets or more. What's the typical bandwidth of a flowlet? Um, it's, yeah, it's uh, your overall bandwidth divided by how many flowlets there are. So there's no, it, it's not like a doubling up like like 2022-7 is. It's not like you're sending all the, the data twice through the network. It's that you're spraying the packets across as many flows as you possibly can because each flow hashes differently through the network, which means that um, if one particular issue in the network happens, uh, like a, you know, RTT increasing or a switch goes down or something like that, what happens is that the um, those specific packets that happen to be assigned to that flowlet will quickly get uh, retransmitted over the other flowlets, and that bad flowlet gets torn down automatically and then brought back up. I say automatically. Um, yeah, it's a little like that. It's a little like risk load share splitting the streams. Um, but. I say automatically, but actually it's just part of the SRD uh, protocol to do that. If you Google uh, if you Google the SRD, the patent is out there if you're curious about actually reading the um, nuts and bolts of, of how it works. I, I encourage you to do so. I know we have some deep technical geeks on calls like this and some people like to do that. So by all means, it's out there. Um, uh, the, the other thing I should mention while we're here is that it's reliable, which means that it's guaranteed that the payload will be delivered from point A to point B. Uh, it's unlike UDP in that way. Um, the only thing is that, so for video, this wasn't designed for video. This was just designed for transmitting large amounts of data through a large network. Um, for video, we have a timeout, right? We, we have a real like, hey, this frame of video is sort of useless to us if it doesn't get from point A to point B it, by the time we need it. So, um, Thomas, if you advance one, I think we start to talk about that a little bit. Oh, so here was, uh, here was Wes's question. What's the typical uh, bandwidth of a flow lit? Yeah, in this case, we're talking about a one gig flow as an example for HD video. Uh, you just divide it by the number of flow lits. So, you know, there might be hundreds of flowlets. So the flow, the flowlets themselves are really small and each one has a very sort of microscopic retransmission buffer. I say microscopic because I actually mean that typically between two instances that are in the same, you know, placement group or availability zone, whatever, um, they're, they're microseconds apart. So those retransmission buffers, because they're parallelized across all the flowlets, you end up with, um, the ability to do quick, quick retransmissions. Uh, who handles retransmissions? Endpoints of the network. Um, Endpoints. The, the sender. The sender. Yeah, the sender. Yeah, but I'm saying the sender handles the the retransmissions. The the sender handles the retransmissions. Um, but okay, let's just leave it at that. In SRD, the sender hand, handles the retransmissions. There's a nuance to it that we'll get into in a minute. If you uh, Thomas, can you advance? Um, outage congestion. Yeah, so this is just saying if if you lose a switch, we're, we're comparing it back to the 2110 example before. If you lose a switch in this case, all of your other flowlets are still happily being flowlets. And then, you know, the sender just realizes that one of the flowlets stopped performing and it, it um, you know, takes it out of the service and creates a new five tuple and then you get a new flowlet. So it's self-healing very quickly, but in the meantime, the packets were probably, you know, resent over one of the other flowlets. And so, okay, so we went back and we redid, thank you. Um, we went back and we redid the test um, sending video frames via SRD versus UDP. 
And this looked promising because we weren't seeing those dropouts, as you can see from the top graph. Um, if you advance to the next one, we also took a look at the impact of a link down in the network. So I don't think anybody's surprised by this, but you know, at the top, a link down, if you have a UDP going through one path in the network, you take a, a link down for any reason, um, the UDP goes away. But with SRD, you take a link down and um, the, the overall payload doesn't go away because 99% of the flows are still up. So that's all this is showing. So we needed to measure this in some way to make sure that we were sane. <laughs> is this actually going to work? Um, so this is just some graphs uh, that we captured that I wanted to share with you uh, between a couple instances uh, running in a couple regions. And basically, I mentioned earlier that um, SRD itself is guaranteed delivery, which means that your payload will be guaranteed to be delivered eventually. And Maybe that's good for some people, but in real-time video workflows, eventually is, is no good. We need, you know, below 16.6 .6 milliseconds for 60p. So that's what this graph is showing. You see a red line running across the top, uh, and all of these colored lines are uh, basically flows that were being tested through the network. And we were just making sure that uh, over the course of time, none of those payloads were late. And by the way, in this case, a payload was one frame of video. So we were sending one frame uncompressed from one instance to the next. Um, this test happened to be 4K. And so we just did that for a while. And then we did that for a while more. So we wanted to make it sure that uh, it would work for, for days on end without any late frames. So that, that's what this data shows. Yeah, so it's not microseconds, but it is you know, within a bounded latency. Right, yeah. So basically under the hood, how this works is that SRD, even if there were to be a late frame, SRD would still deliver the frame eventually, but you put a timeout in it and you say, you know, after 16 and a half milliseconds, I don't care anymore or something. Some applications, you know, you, you can set your latency budget kind of ha however you want, but most customers for, for a live video workflow would would time it out if the frame didn't get there in time, maybe repeat the last frame, maybe blend what you got from the frame that you, you were working on. You know, we all know that error concealment techniques. Um, anyway, um, then, so SRD is all well and good, but we said, oh, this will be really hard if people wanna actually interop with the thing. So um, AWS created this open specification called CDI, which is what we're, um, sort of talking about here. And so for those who are curious, I just want to point out that uh, the, the AVM layer that describes the audio video metadata uh, is very similar to 2110. In fact, it's based on 2110 and it's an open specification. So it's out there, it's on, it's on GitHub and um, feel free to play with it. The transport layer right now is optimized for AWS, but anybody can write uh, more if they'd like, because it's open. So, so it, CDI is on top of SRD and CDI technology is available via an SDK, which is on GitHub. It's available for both Windows and Linux. The SDK is available with a BSD license. Uh, it's, it's open source. Uh, generally, this is going to run inside an availability zone. Um, that, that's one of those AWS uh, terms, uh, but we can explain uh, offline if you want to. Uh, and also, uh, the SDK has a schema uh, uh, for the audio visual management layer. And we'll say, you know, the concept behind the uh, AVM layer of CDI is it allows you to access and alter your pixel data. It supports RGBA for overlays, enables offloading of encoding and decoding from the applications because it's, it's uncompressed. And also there's metadata flows. Uh, so in addition to audio and video, of course, uh, you know, SCSI 104, live closed captioning and any other time metadata. So if you wanna get started with this, you can go to the GitHub page and you can actually take a look at the SDK of CDI. Uh, there also is some more explanation about what CDI is on the AWS website. 
And if you'd like to see how an actual customer is using this, uh, you could watch a AWS reInvent 2020 video starring Evan Staten uh, about Fox uncompressed live sports in the cloud. I think, forget me, I'm not important. The important thing is that there's a customer that's talking about it. <laughs> well, and, and yeah. as, as, as I've been taught, 90% of all new features in AWS come from customer requests. We're, we're highly customer obsessed. So. Is it that low? I thought it was like, well, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's go to the questions, I think. Um, in the last 10 minutes, I've been sort of keeping them keeping track here. I want to get back to this who handles retransmission thing and points to the network. It's related to the question that Kieran had about um, SRD and CDI and, and um, RDMA. Just want to sort of explain a little bit about how it's implemented now. Uh, not that anything is not that anything is set in stone. The way that CDI works is that it uses SRD, which is implemented by the the um, Nitro network cards that are within some AWS instance types. And so what that helps with is offloading the network work uh, similar to RDMA. So what you're doing is you're actually moving your frame buffer into the network card and then saying, hey, network card, move that frame into another instance over there. And so, you know, the question of, who's doing the retransmission, it is the sender, but the sender in this case happens to be a network card that's just been taught how to, how to talk this language. Um, so if you had a purely software sender, then, then that sender would be responsible for it too. So I think that's just more precise version of the, the answer. Um, skipping to sits on top of SRD, which uses standard RDMA primitives. Is it possible to implement CDI at a lower layer by using RDMA directly? This would allow vendors not to have a combined 2110 CDI stack and not have a new stack for CDI alone. Uh, yes and no. So uh, yes, uh, well, okay. So first of all, we didn't talk about it, but CDI has a raw mode. So you can take whatever memory construct that you have and plop it in there and say, put that over there. So if that happens to be a 2110 payload, totally fine, have at it. Um, the curious thing about it though, is a lot of vendors are offloading their 2110 packetization to, to cards anyway, like, like matrix cards or something like that. So that's why I say yes and no. So if you have a purely software sender, you know, those who are doing software sending of 2110 and coalescing their memory into packets, you know, upstream of the network card as it is, then yes, you know, you could take those packets, put them there and say RDMA it over and, um, and be done with it. Yes, we have a 2110 sender. Okay, now the question makes a lot more sense. Well, I see a JPEG access question. Evan, you've, you've been using JPEG access along with CDI, right? No. Um, not yet. So I have some ambitions. I don't know if I can, well, it's, it's an open uh, specification. Like we said, it's on, it's on GitHub. So anybody can write uh, new modules for it, whether that be putting compressed payloads into it, or, you know, even coming up with new transmission methods that might be optimized for different networks. So the idea there is that right now, the, the, send receive module uses SRD, but the AVM layer is separated from it. And the reason that we did that is because we recognized that, that people might want to be able to, to do something like this, but might want to be able to do it on, on different networks. And it was sort of presumptuous to think that all networks would behave the same. So we kind of separated them and, and put them there. And so, you know, where I would like to see the project go is being able to send any compressed payload, whether that be JPEG XS, MPEG frames, uh, you know, whatever, whatever your, your heart dreams up uh, over this, because I think it's a better protocol than, than UDP in the cloud. I hope that answers Carl's question. I think Andy Rayner had a question about the AVM layer. And I'll have to say, you know, we looked into this, the, describing the AVM layer might be an entire another presentation. So keep, keep an eye out for that. Um, the last thing I'll say, I mentioned that this is currently running as an offloaded th 
thing on network cards that are handling it. So um, when you install CDI, you, you don't actually need to build RD, uh, sorry, SRD from scratch, um, which is which is good, but also it has the downside that you're you're stuck right now with instances that have elastic fabric adapter. And so the other place that I would like to see the project go, uh, and again, I'm, I'm pitching it out to the world here, like we do at VSF, anybody's welcome to get involved, it's open, right? So um, is to have an SRD sender that does not rely on, on um, <clears throat> elastic fabric adapter, which would enable this to run on any instance as small as they can be. So right now it requires pretty big instances. And one of the worries that customers and, and vendors alike have had is um, making that cost right-sized. So uh, please let me know what you see out there. Let me know if you're interested in helping and we'll get people plugged into the right places. You know, feel free to reach out to Thomas and I. Our emails are here. You probably have our phone numbers and can text us. Thank you guys very much. We appreciate your uh, coming and presenting. And Evan, come back, present some more. We'd love to have you. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Terrific.